Hello, I'm Mr Craven, Senior Director of English for Northern Education Trust, and this is going to be a quick 10-minute talk-through, focusing today on gender and fertility in Shakespeare's Macbeth. Right, let's start with a quick overview of how Shakespeare presents gender. I say quick overview because you could easily write you know, an entire book on this topic. Now, the view presented of masculinity is reasonably straightforward, and it's essentially the Jacobean stereotype. To be a man is, as you can see from the list on the screen, it's to be decisive, it's to be heroic in battle, it's to have the capacity for violence, it's to control, to assert dominance, to lack guilt, to be emotionally resilient, and it's to father children. And more of that last one in a minute. Now, where we run into a more interesting discussion, I think, is around femininity in the play. The equivalent Jacobean stereotype of being female is one of obedience, it's of humility, of acceptance, of submission, of, of guilt for sin, of emotional sensitivity, and of producing children. Now, Macbeth as a character fits with the majority of these. He's heroic in battle. We know that right from the start. He's fighting against those overwhelming odds in Act 1, Scene 2, where his, his brandished steel smoked with bloody execution, where he was carving out his passage. Now, Macbeth is violent, obviously. He's unseamed the traitor MacDonald from the knave to the chaps. Now, a number of the remaining masculine qualities we've just mentioned are actually quite undermined by Lady Macbeth. We will proceed no further in this, he tells his wife in Act 1, Scene 7, only for her to manipulate him into committing the murder. Will all great Neptune's oceans wash the blood clean from my hands, he asks in Act 2, Scene 2, consumed at that point by guilt over what he's been manipulated into doing. And it's noticeable that Lady Macbeth undermines her husband in almost every possible way, She's assertive and she's manipulative rather than being obedient. She controls and she directs rather than accepting. She claims that her husband is too full of the milk of human kindness and that her hands are of your colour, but I shame to wear a heart so white. Now, Lady Macbeth is the Eve to Macbeth's Adam. And it's no accident that her advice to her husband is to look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it in Act 1, Scene 5. She is, in a sense, the origin of the active sin in the play, the original sin. Now, Lady Macbeth also seems to embody some of the worst female stereotypes. She is the temptress, she is corrupted, immoral, untrustworthy, and, ultimately, emotionally unstable. Now, Lady Macbeth also seems to constantly interrogate her husband's masculinity. When you just do it, then you were a man, she tells him in Act 1, Scene 7. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. By Act 3, Scene 4, she's asking, are you a man? And whether he is quite unmanned in folly. Now, the comparison she's making originally, if you go back you know, to the, the origins of the play, are really primarily of being a man as opposed to being a beast. She's asking whether he's a rational human being who can control himself, or just this uncontrollable, instinctive, emotional beast. But for a modern audience, that gender interpretation actually seems to gain far more traction. And Lady Macbeth is, obviously, someone who does interrogate gender on a number of levels. She begs spirits to unsex me here, and to come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall. She wants to sacrifice her femininity, and the language is really sacrificial, notice. And she wants to do that to gain what she sees as the power of masculinity. To be strong, to be cruel, to be uncaring, to be dynamic, to be independent. Now, Lady Macbeth is a transgressive character. She's a monstrous woman, to use you know, um, a proper literary phrase. She interrogates gender stereotypes. And she was played, of course, originally, by a male actor. And that's another level of this interrogation of gender. And remember, of course... The while Shakespeare may interrogate gender roles, Lady Macbeth does, of course, revert to conventional gender stereotypes and to conventional gender assumptions at the end of the play because she loses her sanity due to guilt. Shakespeare, as ever, is willing to test social boundaries. 
but he has to be seen to reflect social norms in the resolution of the play. The deviants have to be brought into line, the wicked have to be punished, the good need to be rewarded. What's perhaps more interesting is the question around producing children. Lady Macbeth has had children, and the play makes that really clear. She has given suck, and knows how tender it is to love the babe that milks me, in Act 1, Scene 7. And that fits with the historical figures on whom the play is based. The real Lady Macbeth, Gruach, had indeed been married before she married Macbeth, and she had had a child, Lulach, with her first husband. Macbeth, the historical figure, in contrast, had no children. And that, for me, is actually the far more interesting question. So how important is fertility in Macbeth? So let's start with some basics. Now, Macbeth is a figure of sterility and of death rather than of fertility. For at one scene two onwards, he's linked to destruction, to death. We have, again, the bloody execution in the battle. We have the murders of Duncan and Banquo. We've got the slaughter of Macduff's family. Even more than that, Macbeth is, is painfully aware of his own lack of children. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown, he laments in Act 3, Scene 1, and put a barren scepter in my grip. He has no children, Macduff notes in Act 4, Scene 3. The question is why it matters. Now, fertility, producing an heir, is the key aspect of masculinity that I think Macbeth lacks. More than that, having children is seen as a sign of divine favour, especially for kings. If God approves of you, then you have children. It's why Macbeth is so disturbed by the apparition he sees shown by the witches of the show of eight kings, especially when the eighth king is carrying a mirror in which, in the original performance, King James would have seen himself reflected. King James here is the living continuation of Banquo's line. And that's because having an heir, having children, means there's a future. And that's the kind of language and the kind of imagery that we find associated in the play with the characters who are fertile. Now, Lydia Macbeth, for example, talks about her woman's breasts and her milk. She reminds her husband that she has given suck. She knows, again, how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. Of the two of them, he is the infertile one, not her. And when she's manipulating him, when she's trying to control him, she seems only too happy to remind him of exactly that fact. And every comment there is a reminder to him of his sterility, of his failure as a man, and of his lack of a future. Even more than this, we see fertility as a recurring image in the play, associated predominantly with, with, with Banquo and with Duncan. Now Banquo in Act 1, Scene 3, asks the witches to look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow. Duncan tells Banquo that he has begun to plant thee and will labour to make thee full of growing, and that's uh, in Act 1, Scene 4. Banquo then uses the same pattern of imagery, promising that if I grow, the harvest is your own. And it's this recurring image we have here of growth, of fertility. Now Banquo also notes the importance of children in terms of the prophecy that he was given by the witches. He describes himself as the root and father of many kings in Act 3, Scene 1. And that's the same scene that finds Macbeth lamenting all his work simply to make them kings, the seed of Banquo kings. Now Banquo's got children, and he's therefore got a future of growth, of fertility. Macbeth has no children, and he's therefore got no future. It makes sense from that perspective that Macbeth should try to kill not just Banquo, but Fleance. If Macbeth can end the line of Banquo, then perhaps, perhaps, the witches are wrong. And there's, therefore, the potential for a, uh, a Macbethian lineage. And notice the kinds of image that Macbeth uses to describe life. Life of Macbeth by Act 5 is a tale told by an idiot. It's something fictional, it's something fixed, it's not real. Um, you know, life should be something organic, something real, and for Macbeth it isn't. It's, it's a candle, 
It's something brief and it's ephemeral. It burns down and it burns out rather than reproducing or generating anything. And after all, remember, with the death of Lady Macbeth, Macbeth's ability to produce an heir is severely curtailed. It does, after all, take two. And notice also who Macbeth kills during the course of the play. Duncan, the father of two sons. Banquo, the father of a son, and the father of a future line of kings. And that's linked, of course, with the attempt on Fleance, who is also, through Banquo, you know, his father, Fleance is the father of a future line of kings. Macbeth kills Macduff's family, who are the living proof of Macduff's successful masculinity and of his future. Macduff's son, of course, is described as an egg associated with, with, with new life. Even in the battle at the end, Macbeth kills young Seward, who is the son of the English general. And when Macbeth dies, there's no legacy, there's no aftermath, there's no lasting impact. Macbeth described himself in Act 5, Scene 8 as someone who bore a charmed life. A life, in a sense, outside of the natural order. A life that must not yield to one of woman born, he believed. Macbeth is someone who believes himself, incorrectly, to be outside of the cycles of life and birth and death. But by the end, Macbeth was simply this dead butcher, someone associated with brutality and with dead flesh. Macbeth doesn't build, he doesn't grow, he doesn't generate. He simply damages, he destroys, he kills. Malcolm, in contrast, speaks in his final monologue about what would be planted newly with the time. Malcolm, completely contrasting with Macbeth, is a figure of growth. He is a figure of the future. Now hopefully that's been useful, um, and stroke or interesting, and stroke or simply a refresher in terms of ideas you've already come across or quotations you've already learned. If you do have any questions or want to discuss further that sort of thing, do please talk to your English teacher or any of the directors who would be more than happy to do so. Either way, thank you very much for listening.